Hello, everybody. Dennis Prager here. Third hour on Tuesdays each week is the Ultimate Issues Hour. And as I say, just about each week, at about the age of 28 and a half, people stop talking about Ultimate Issues because they're too concerned about making a living, hopefully about making a family, personal issues, marital issues, family issues, financial issues, and they stop thinking about the great issues. It's a big loss in people's lives, so we have the ultimate issues hour, and of course the greatest ultimate issue is, is there a God? And taking on this question, and, and there are many books on this, so I only choose something I consider to be exceptional. Brand new book, Why Science Does Not Disprove God. And for anybody who thinks that science disproves God, this may be the best book out there. I say maybe because I don't know all of them. It's, uh, how about this? It's the best I know of. Why Science Does Not Disprove God. The author, Amir Axel. Did I pronounce your name correctly, sir? Yes, perfect. Good to be on the show. Thank you. Let me let me say a little about you and embarrass you for a moment, if I may. Uh, he is a Ph.D. in uh, in mathematics, and he writes on science for the New York Times, Scientific American, the Wall Street Journal. He's on Science Friday on NPR, and uh, despite the latter, I am very happy <laughs> to have him on my show. It's just a running joke with my listeners, so you don't have to laugh. Anyway, it is a pleasure to have you. And the book, of course, is up at DennisPrager.com. Who's Deborah? That's my wife. Okay. I, I like to ask authors who they dedicated their uh, their book to. Did, uh, did she help write it, or is she just a terrific wife? Well, um, both. Uh, she didn't help write it. She, she helped me edit it. She, she yes. teaches writing at MIT, and uh, uh -huh. so she's a... She's well, a so you cheated. You know, that's cheating, sir. <laughs> yeah, you're married to a woman who teaches writing at MIT. I... <laughs> <laughs> All right, th th this is, it's so good, folks. I, I just have a smile. Now, let me, let me just uh, understand where you're coming from. And not, not that it matters. All that matters is what you wrote. But I, I want to just understand, you're, if I may use this word, you're a, a annoyed that people use science to disprove God. Yes, that's what made me write the book. Good, so I got it right. Yeah, why don't you explain that? Well, um, the, the, like everything, the, there's a uh, an academic reason or, or an intellectual reason and, and a personal reason. So the um, more objective reason is that um, there was a book that came out two years ago saying a universe, uh, the, the title was The Universe from Nothing. The universe just popped into existence. I, I had him on, Lawrence Krauss. Right. And the premise that this book is based on is, is incorrect. Um, the universe, the, it has to do with the definition of nothingness. Now, if you say nothing is empty space, then he would be right, because we know that in empty space, because of quantum mechanics, quantum field theory, um, particles come in and out of existence. Uh, this goes back to Einstein, uh, who showed that energy and mass are the same thing. So if you have energy in, in empty space, and you always have energy in, in empty space, you'll have particles. That's how matter sort of pops into existence. That's true. But that doesn't happen from pure emptiness. So, and, and, and the, um, in, in fact, there is something called quantum foam, which physicists talk about, and that pre-existed the universe. So the, the premise of that book is, is not correct, and that's what got me into it. But I was fortunate to go to, and that gets to the other reason that I mentioned, I got to be invited to a, to a great conference in Mexico where, where Krauss spoke uh, one time, but the time that I have in mind now is another time where Richard Dawkins, who is uh, the biggest um, a scientist, atheist, uh, probably the most famous in the world, um, was speaking, and I was speaking there too. Um, we were on the stage together, and uh, he um, he gave a talk, you know, explaining why he believes science disproves any kind of God. And my daughter was with me. She's a young science student. She's interested in science. She's not particularly religious, but she asked him after the talk. Um, something about how do you use 
scientific support for, for conclusions, and he assumed that she was questioning him or something, and he said, uh, you can believe in unicorns if you like, turned around and walked away. <laughs> So I thought, this is funny. These people are very, very aggressive about their their premise. And if you disagree with them, they, they become um, pretty Testy. unpleasant. Yeah, exactly. Uh, he He's the worst of, of the lot in that regard. And, and, and by the way, just for my listeners' interest, he's the only uh, prominent atheist I have not debated. And uh, he just won't, he won't come on the show. I'm not saying he's afraid of me. I'm just I just want people to understand though that he's in a unique position uh, uh, in, the, in that regard. Now you said so. Is that the personal reason? Because you said they were right. Three that reasons. was the personal reason, insulting my daughter. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good reason. A very good reason, actually. So in other words, there's a certain arrogance that uh, uh, for anyone who says science disproves God, that is your statement. Absolutely, it's, and it's like they because they are scientists and they know something about science, they they feel that they could tell us what you know what what is correct and what is not. It's like you know when you go to a doctor and the doctor thinks you may have something, but you may have something else altogether. And they say, oh, you need to do this and that. And they always talk So to I would that. like that. I'm going to pose a question uh, to you that uh, has intrigued me my whole life. What do you think animates them? Why would I understand why someone would see all the suffering in the world and say it's very hard to believe in God. I understand that. But these people are rooting for there not to be a God. How do you explain that? To me, it's a kind of religion on its own. And when you talk to them, you see that they have the same fervor and the same passion that, that uh, you know, somebody would have speaking for a religion. They want you to believe what they believe. And, and Dawkins in particular, um, I did get a chance to talk to him, you know, personally, myself, during that conference and another one. And he, he's very passionate, and he, he wants to convert us all to this religion called atheism. And there are other people, such as Dennett. I don't know if you debated Yes, him. I had Dennett on the show, yeah. Oh, good. And he, uh, <laughs> as, you, as you probably know, he, he, he and his wife run cruises for atheists <laughs> and all, kind of, all kinds of, uh, you know, activities for atheists to sort of form a community. And, 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 right. Uh, yeah. No, no, I, I know, but I, I, even then, uh, you're t I agree with every word, but it's still, did, are you familiar with uh, uh, the, the, astro the astro God and the Astronomers by Robert Jastrow? No. I'm oh, you, 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 for that alone, you'll be happy you came on my show. <laughs> no, no, I'm serious, you, you must write this uh, note to yourself. Right now. Yes, because he was, a, I, I knew him personally, he was the head of the Goddard Space Center at NASA. Okay. He was a major astronomer. We were quite friendly, and he was an agnostic. He was, he's not a believer. Uh, but he he wrote he couldn't believe how distressed so many of his colleagues were when the Big Bang Theory came out because it suggested a beginning, and a beginning suggests a beginner. And this right. bugged them. And he said, scientists should never be bugged by evidence. That's right. That's that's very true. In fact, in in, in the book, as, as you probably notice, I, I have this um, anecdote or, or really cute story about Genesis being right about there being a beginning to the universe, and from 1917 to 1929, when uh, Hubble discovered the expansion of the universe, from from 17 when Einstein wrote his cosmological model, the thought was that the universe has always been there. And it's really Genesis that, that um, in a sense, I, I just found it out now, after writing the book, that um, Lemaitre, who I knew was, was the Big Bang proposer, you know, he's a mathematician and, and a priest, too, he was motivated by Genesis to find a beginning of the universe, which I think is amazing. That's big stuff. The chapter titles alone, uh, folks, uh, it's a self-recommending book. I, I, I use that term very carefully and uh, why archaeology does not disprove the bible the revolt of science einstein god and the big bang god and the quantum the universe from nothing deception we're going to talk about a number of those the book why science does not disprove god and the author uh, at boston university and elsewhere amir axel is up at the dennis prager.com website this is AM 870, The Answer.
Hi, everybody. Dennis Prager here. A truly significant book has just been published by a nationally renowned science writer. He has received the Guggenheim Foundation Fellowship, was a visiting scholar at Harvard. He's now a research fellow in the history of science at Boston University. He's written for Discover Magazine, Scientific American, New York Times, Wall Street Journal. So you get the, you get the idea. And his name is Amir Akzel, A-C-Z-E-L. Is that Turkish? No, it's Hungarian. Uh, my father was a Hungarian Jew. He moved to uh, Palestine of those days and uh, founded Israeli shipping company. So I grew up on a ship traveling the Mediterranean, but I was born in Israel, and that's where the Amir comes from. Right. That's a good point. Good point. All right. The book is Why Science Does Not Disprove God. You write, incidentally, and it's very powerful, uh, you write the purpose, in the, and you italicize it, the purpose of this book is to defend the integrity of science. You feel that science has been abused by the new atheists. Exactly. That's what they're doing because um, they're, they're stretching things very far beyond what science shows. Even when you talk about the Big Bang and uh, people say, well, you know, science has shown us what happened a fraction of a second after the Big Bang, but it's so mysterious. I mean, think about it. There was this immense explosion, which we don't really understand, and right afterwards there's this Higgs particle, and I spent a lot of time at CERN where the Higgs was discovered talking to all the, the heads of the experiments there who will get a Nobel Prize any, any you, year. Is, now. It, is that Switzerland? Right. It's, yeah. it's interesting. It's between Switzerland and France. Okay. And when you go there, at one moment you're in France, and then you cross the border to Switzerland and back and forth. And right. The, the protons go underground between the two countries. Uh -huh, very interesting. Uh -huh. International so, protons. Right. So um, you, you, the, the Higgs is this God particle that suddenly gives everything mass for no reason, you know, it's just a field that gives everything mass. It just comes into existence after the Big Bang. And then there you have the quark soup, which is this immensely hot plasma of particles. And as if by magic, the quarks... The two ups and a down will will form together, come together to form a proton, and two downs and an up will make a neutron. That's exactly what we need for matter. Why does it happen, and why do the charges match exactly that of the electron? Just when they come together, they have a charge that matches exactly that of the electron, and the masses and the forces of interaction. Everything works together just to create life. I mean, and a universe that would eventually give life. That, that is so mysterious to me to say, hey, we understand what happened after the Big Bang, so there's no need for God anymore. To me, it's the opposite. Um, it's so weird what we find out and so complicated and so mathematically intricate. It takes pages and pages of formulas to explain just one particle. Why can you, how can you say we now show that there is no God? <laughs> yes. So uh, how, how do you... Uh, account for some of the uh, argument. How do you respond to some of the arguments that they offer? For example, the multiverse. And I just want to explain to my listeners this. This really, I have to say, doesn't uh, increase my respect for the the so-called new atheists. They pretty much have acknowledged that they cannot explain all of these things that are so intricate to make up this universe. So they say, well, there are an infinite number of universes, so anything is possible, including another Amir Axel in, in an alternate uh, universe. How do you respond to that? Well, that, that's a really big issue, and I, I actually debated Brian Greene on that um, uh, and, and questioned the, the multiverse when he first came out with that hypothesis in the book. Um, if there, there's something in mathematics, uh, the idea of a monkey typing Hamlet. So if you put a, a monkey in front of a computer and, and, and have him type whatever randomly, a random string of characters eventually will, will constitute Right, Hamlet. enough monkeys on enough typewriters for enough years and you'll get Hamlet. Right, and the number of years has to go very quickly to infinity. Correct. So when you invoke infinity, anything can happen. Yes, and, right. 
So what is your that is, is your response? You're just invoking infinity for the sake of argument? Right, and we don't even know if it, and what infinity means. Nothing in our world is really infinite. Good point. That's great. And anyway, is there, they admit there isn't a shred of evidence, and there cannot be, they acknowledge, for the existence of another universe. Exactly. All we know is this universe. Yes, and, and we can't know another. No, we can't. We have so, no so it, of... Right, so, okay, so that's why... We even why... can't know other parts of our own universe. Yeah. Here's an interesting fact. If you point a telescope in one direction in the sky and see the farthest galaxy that you can see with a powerful telescope and then point it 180 degrees in the other direction of the sky and find another galaxy very far from us, these two galaxies, the, the one communicate with each other, if light goes from one toward the other, it will never reach it. Isn't that interesting? Why not? Because the universe is expanding faster than the speed of light. It is? Yes. There, what, there is something that is happening faster than the speed of light? That's, that's right. In I fact, didn't it know comes that. from the same Einstein who taught us that nothing goes faster than yes, light. Yes, that's right. But space can expand faster than light relative to, the, to different points. For example, uh, basically a point in one direction very far from us and a point very far from us in the other direction, they they are expanding with respect to each other faster than the speed of light. Now, if you can do this, incidentally, uh, I, I, I will send my producer to cook a meal for you. <laughs> uh, but explain to me how the universe expands in, in the sense that what is it expanding into? It's creating space. It's creating space. Okay, yeah, I, I, now, I, I know every word you said. I have a good command of English, but I have no clue what that means. Do you understand what you just said? Well, I try to. Uh, when, when, when you have the Big Bang, there's something called inflation, and there was a big announcement of a scientific discovery just a month ago. And I'm sorry, a little over a month ago, on the 17th of March at Harvard Smithsonian, uh, and um, they discovered gravitational waves. I'm sure everybody heard about that. And that is something that emanates with the Big Bang. And because of inflation, inflation is a theory uh, proposed by Alan Guth, who is actually my neighbor here, uh, it, it, it's saying that the universe expanded exponentially fast when it was very, very young, within a fraction of a second after the Big Bang. So that's called inflation. Okay, hold it there for a moment, if you would. Forgive me. I just want to reintroduce the book. I've got to take a break. Why Science Does Not Disprove God completely readable by the layperson and it does exactly what its title says we will return and if you think science does disprove god 18 prager 776 you know it is about time we had a good uh, piece of classical music here when uh, that's bach right in one of his violin concerti Hey, not bad. I think he wrote two violin concertos. Is it E minor? Do you know? That would be that. Uh, I, I want to impress my guest. I, that, this is the only reason I'm mentioning this. I, I could tell it's Bach, but <laughs> yeah. Well, that's good, sir. That no, no, that is big. Uh, anyway, uh, if this book does not become a bestseller, there is no God. <laughs> uh, that will be an argument against divine intervention in human life. This, that is how much I endorse it. Uh, this is the Ultimate Issues Hour, third hour every Tuesday, big issues every Tuesday, third hour. Why science does not disprove God. He's a science writer uh, for everybody, from Scientific American to the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, and uh, as a Guggenheim Memorial Foundation Fellowship, visiting scholar at Harvard, currently a research fellow, history of science at Boston University. I'll be very curious uh, to see how uh, people in science uh, react. They try to ignore or mock, in the case of Dawkins, he, he mocks, but as you pointed out, that was one of your personal reasons, which I loved, uh, for, for writing this. Well, what is your take on evolution? Evolution is, is hard to, to, uh, to attack because it's a very powerful theory, and it, it, it's, uh, it taints you if you attack it. If you say, uh, then, then you're immediately um, painted as a, as a creationist. And, um, so, but but ev having said that, evolution has big holes in it. It doesn't explain how life originally came, on, uh, came about 
emerged on this planet. Um, there's no, no explanation of evolution at all. Neither does it have an, an explanation of the complicated cells that make up uh, advanced or, or organisms, uh, eukaryotic cells. There is no explanation for consciousness, how it emerges. We have no idea. Evolution doesn't solve that. And what um, one of my favorites is evolution really doesn't explain things, even, even simple traits like altruism. Not simple, but I mean tra not, not only um, big steps in, in, in the emergence of humans on this planet, but, but also traits that should disappear according to the evolutionary theory and some of them don't for example uh, you know the the idea is that you do everything that will propagate your dna and if it's not your dna because you'll kill yourself doing it it's the dna of your progeny your 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 descendants and so on so so um you, you jump into the fire to save a child that would make sense uh, from an evolutionary point of view but to jump into the fire as, as, as a fireman would do to save a cat that not explainable by um, by evolutionary theory. That's a trait that should disappear as as life goes on. Because uh, those people who do that, they're are DNA. you uh, uh, are you familiar with Stephen Meyer? Yes, right. Well, because uh, I adore him, and I think Darwin's doubt uh, is 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 in, in a league with your book as right. one of the most significant of the last decade. Uh, he writes that the Cambrian explosion is not explainable uh, by evolution. Oh, that's good. Yeah, that, that's that's his basic thing. They're, you know, all of these new species uh, in, in relatively at the same time, mm -hmm. and, and and he calls it Darwin's doubt because Darwin said that that he didn't know how that happened. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's but your point that if, if preface in answering my question was. It has been rendered uh, case closed. Right, and in fact, if you many people warned me when I wrote this book because I've been a science writer and writing very objectively about science for twenty years, and uh, people who, who I respect a lot, uh, a friend of mine who's a Nobel Prize winner in physics, told me you write this book and people will you lose your audience. People will think you're a creationist, and that's because evolution is such a you know socially it's a religion right yes exactly it's exactly I, I I only came to that much much later in life why science does not disprove God Amir Amir Axel book book is up at my website we continue in a moment hi everybody this is the ultimate issues hour on the Dennis Prager show Tuesdays the third hour each week are devoted to an ultimate issue. The ultimate, ultimate issue is God's existence. So, having dealt with it myself, we have a number of terrific courses on it at the Prager University. And for somebody to be invited on to make the case, I have atheists on regularly, but if I, if I choose somebody who's written on behalf of God, it means that it's an exceptional work and this is why science does not disprove God I've already listed many of his credentials and so I won't repeat them right now his name is Amir Akzel so uh, let me go to the other side and again if any of you think that science does please call in I'm, I'm trying to restrict calls by and large to skeptics or those related to uh, issues of skepticism 18 Prager 776 so I, I presume I know the answer to this, but if science does not disprove God, I my take is you would say that science does not prove God either, but it suggests God. Is that a fair? To me, it does. To me personally, it suggests God because of the structure, the immensely intricate structure of everything in the universe. You pick pick some grain of sand, and and you think, oh, it's just a grain of sand, and and the. The mathematics needed to describe it is so complicated. And when you get to the quantum level, this is really the biggest mystery of all to me. Well, one of the biggest mysteries. Why? What is quantum mechanics? Richard Feynman said, if you think you understand quantum mechanics, then you don't understand quantum yeah, mechanics. Yeah, I love that line in your book. Right? Yeah. Isn't that a great one? Yeah. So you, you, 
we don't really understand nature. It's a theory we can use and make fantastic predictions, um, but very, very accurate predictions. But nobody knows what it is. What happens when you measure a particle and suddenly it's not in the superposition of many states? Uh, does does the wave go elsewhere into many worlds, or does it is really a probability interpretation called the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics? We are nowhere in the begin, even not even the beginning of understanding that, and that to me suggests some greater power. Uh, some call it God. What do you call it? I call it God. I believe in Einstein's God, and I've written books about Einstein and researched his life a lot. And he, I never understood uh, that God doesn't play dice with the universe. Is that the quote? Yes. Yeah, I, I, I must he, admit, he said, I, hear, I hear it all the time, and I never understand well, it. What does that, that really, mean? Re I'll tell you what it means. It really refers to what, I, what we just talked about a second ago. Quantum mechanics, the usual interpretation of quantum mechanics is probabilistic, which means something happens because it has a set of probabilities, and when you do the experiment, you observe one of the outcomes, and, and you, uh, if you did the experiment 100 times, then if you get it 15 times, that means the probability is 15%, something like that. Einstein said, come on, people, God doesn't play dice. If there is a God, God tells you exactly what will happen. It's, there's no roulette wheel or, or dice. I see. So we, uh -huh. so because there, uh, so there is a God, therefore there are rules. Yes, exactly. He believed in an orderly universe. He believed that everything should, is, is ordered by some big man with a white beard up there. You know, it, it does, you know. He, he so why, did, do, why do atheists frequently cite Einstein? Well, because Einstein was a very strange guy when it comes to things like that. He left us clues in both directions. He That's said what he I thought. Yeah. Okay, go on. Yeah. He, doesn't, he said he doesn't believe in a personal God, mm -hmm. and, that, uh, and, and he was very strong about that. There's a story that not many people know about him. When he was in Prague, uh, he, was, he was more religious than in any, that was 1913, than any other time in his life. Religious meaning following a, a natural religion. And he did go to synagogue. Um, and when at one point, at one point when he was in Prague, a, an Orthodox Jew asked him, "Can you recommend a, a restaurant, a, a kosher restaurant?" And he told him, "He said, but is it strictly kosher?" And Einstein snapped at him and said, um, that "Only an ox eats strictly kosher." So you know, he, he left a lot, a lot of different clues. Some, some he said, you know, he talked about God all the time. Not only God plays. It uh, doesn't play dice with the universe, but uh, I want to know God's thoughts. The rest are details. That's, he said that. And so he thought of the rules of physics as God's thoughts, which I think is very beautiful. Now, what do you say to the atheist claim, well, yes, of course, we can't explain X, Y, or Z today, but we couldn't explain A, B, C, D, E, and F 100 years ago. Science will explain everything ultimately. Well, the difference is an interpretation of the word explain. We can explain the electron using quantum mechanics, but we can never say why. And that is not something that changes, because the atheists will tell you, look, we, as, as you just said, we explained A, B, C, D, E, in the next few years we'll, we'll uh, explain G, H, I, J, K, and so on, and at some point we'll explain everything, and then there's no God. So give us a break. You know, we're, we're on our way. Science is a... Uh, project you know that's ongoing and at some point but the point is when you do a b c d and e you don't really understand why you understand the rules but the rules right. are so complicated mm -hmm. and require a mathematics that's so advanced and some of it is mathematics we still don't have even because einstein tried to do a, a, a the theory of everything and he failed some people will tell you string theory is the theory so are, are you uh, of the belief that it it suggests, science suggests that it was all created ultimately, and this is an anthropocentric, obviously anthropocentric view, for man to exist. That's difficult for me to say that it's for man to exist because man is, is a very... Because man is what, I'm sorry? A, a very unpleasant animal in many ways, you know, and uh, you know, we're good and bad, we're intelligent and stupid, we, right. we do things right. that we're, we're well, not... Well, he, he, according to Genesis, he thought we would be better than we are. He got very disappointed. I have a feeling we share a lot of views. Why science does not disprove God, I, Amir Axel, we return in a moment, Ultimate Issues Hour, The Dennis Prager Show. 
Hi, everybody. Dennis Prager here. Why science does not disprove God, it is powerful stuff from a man who uh, is at uh, Boston University, has been at Harvard, he has a Ph.D. in mathematics. Incidentally, on this mathematics issue, which is pretty much terra incognita for me, you know, foreign territory, but uh, I did have a man on, he teaches at Berkeley, he's originally from the Soviet Union, and who wrote a book on why math is fun, and I had him on, and it, it was a lot of fun to talk to him. So you got your Ph.D. in mathematics. Does mathematics argue for a god, or are they, it's irrelevant? That's a really good question, really excellent question, because I, I find out that mathematicians are much more likely to believe in God than physicists, for example. Physicists think may be led to think, well, we understand this and we understand that. Why would we need a god? But a mathematician from the very beginning is more likely to believe in God because most mathematicians are platonic in their views, which means they believe that numbers exist regardless of the physical universe. Numbers have to have this milieu where they live. If, if the universe wasn't here, numbers would still exist. And when you teach yourself to think that way, that there is a kind of a setting, you know, beyond the universe, where numbers exist and, and things like a perfect square and a perfect circle, which we don't really have on, on Earth and in the universe, then you're more likely to believe in God. What does that mean we don't have a perfect circle or don't have a perfect square? What does well, that mean? Whatever you, if you write a circle on, on something, it will never be 100% perfect. There might be slight deviations from, from you know, exactly... You mean even a, a machine can't do it? A computer right. can't do it? Right, well, a machine it? will do it to, to a very high precision, but not perfect. But a perfect circle is one where you divide... You know the the circumference by by the diameter, and you'll. Um, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, the diameter by the circumference. I'm sorry, the circumference by the diameter. You'll get 3.141, so you know, and so on. It's an infinite sequence. So to 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 make it precise is 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 very hard. You you, have to, you can make it to any level of precision, but there's always a better one. So so it, it, so I got to ask you a final question. Forgive me because we have 30 seconds. So. Your current state is there probably is a God. I believe in a God, yes. Yeah. And and do you believe God knows you? 